good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this webinar. I'm Ernesto Aguilar with the National Federation of Community Broadcasters, the Program Director, and FCB CEO Sally Kane will today offer you some context and introduce our speakers. But before that, I want to hand it off to Sally, but just share a few items. You are attending today's session in listen mode. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A chat box. Your question will be held at the end of the webinar, but may be inserted if it's relevant during a particular point in the conversation. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted at NFCB's website. And finally, the National Federation of Community Broadcasters has served the needs of non-commercial radio broadcasters since 1975. We provide support and guidance for new and veteran broadcasters. Membership information is available at NFCB. Org. And thank you for joining us. With that, I want to hand it off to Sally Kane. Thanks, Ernesto. And I'll add a good morning to the chorus since we've got about five time zones going on. It's not quite noon, Colorado or on the West Coast. Good to see you all here today. And, um, and Ernesto, I want to thank you for all you're doing to deliver these valuable services to our members and friends of community media around the country. It's been 10 years since the FCC opened an application window, so this is big news. It comes with important information that we felt strongly about sharing with all of you. We have two very distinguished attorneys leading the webinar, whom I will introduce in just a moment. Before I do that, I wanted to be sure to let you know that we will get to as many of your questions as we're able to, um, but we want to impart the critical content that we need to get out as well. So our goal here is to help you understand and potentially prepare yourselves for the application process. To that end, we've asked our presenters to be specific about the information they impart and not get into topics beyond the scope of this new FCC application window, um, such as major modification requests, the MX process, power upgrades. This is really, this webinar is really about growing service with a new frequency, as you will soon see. And now it is my um, distinct honor to introduce Francisco Montero and Keenan Lomchak. Um, Frank Montero is a managing partner with the law firm of Fletcher, Heald, and Hildreth, specializing in telecommunications, broadcasting, media, and technology. Frank served as director of the FCC's Office of Communications Business Opportunities during the Clinton administration. He was recognized by the chairman of the FCC for dedication to bridging the digital divide while serving as a member of the Federal Advisory Committee on Diversity for Communications in the Digital Age. Frank has been inducted to the Minority Media and Telecommunication Council's Hall of Fame. He is a regular presenter at NFCB conferences and a great friend to community radio. And Keenan Adam checked on Fletcher, Heald, and Hildreth in 2016 and has a practice covering a broad range of regulatory, transactional, and appellate matters. Keenan has experience representing both radio and television broadcasters before the FCC on matters including license renewals, transactions, enforcement matters, and other regulatory compliance issues. While attending law school at the George Washington University School of Law, he won best brief in the 2014 National Telecommunications Moot Court Competition and clerked for then acting FCC Chairwoman Mignon Clyburn, who many of you know and has been a staunch advocate for um, the citizenry side of this whole telecommunications tension zone between um, users and suppliers. So gentlemen, with that, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you so much, Sally. I really, really appreciate it. And you too, Ernesto, uh, for, for setting this up. And, uh, and uh, I think it's a, a, a valuable topic, a timely topic, and we're looking forward to giving this presentation. Let me start by just introducing myself. I'm Frank Montero with the firm of Fletcher Hill and Hildreth, as Sally mentioned. Um, I think I've met a lot of the NFCB folks that are on, on, uh, on today. Uh, you 
seen me speak at the NFCB conferences before, and uh, and we've been a sponsor of, uh, of your organization, a big supporter of your organization for, for a very, very long time. And uh, some of you, by the way, may also know me as Francisco Montero, that's my full name, but uh, I figured just for, for today, we're gonna keep it to Frank, which, uh, which uh, will keep it easier. Um, I have with me one of my colleagues, Keenan Adamchek, and, uh, and, and Keenan and I, as well as a small group here at the firm, have done a lot of work with both community and public broadcasters. We've uh, represented a, a, a lot of uh, uh, stations um, in that space and have you know, uh, repeatedly uh, given presentations on, uh, on CPB funding, on a variety of different topics to NFCB and to APTS, to NIDA, the, the public radio super regional and, uh, and other uh, uh, platforms like that. So it's good to see everyone. Um, also, before I get started, um, uh, I wanna uh, uh, make you all aware of some resources that our firm has beyond what we're gonna talk about today, but a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is also available on these resources. We have a, a blog, which is comlawblog.com, C-O-M-M, L-A-W-B-L-O-G.com. And on there, you, it's free and you can get uh, a lot of articles and resources on a wide variety of FCC related topics, including these. So please check it out. And then also we have a YouTube page, which if you go to YouTube and just search Fletcher Heald, you're gonna find uh, a variety of different videos. Um, this, um, this presentation uh, uh, will likely end up there as well, where you can just get a lot of information about a variety of FCC topics, license renewals, um, a variety of different issues like that. So please uh, 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 look at those as well. So today's topic is going to be to discuss the upcoming FCC filing window for non-commercial educational full power FM stations, as well as low power FM stations. Um, our webinar is gonna cover um, the the announced upcoming filing windows for uh, these two services, um, what to expect from those rules, and we're gonna, gonna talk a little bit about the processes for, uh, for, those, uh, for those filings. And, um, and then we're gonna talk about um, the qualification criteria that the FCC looks at to apply, how the FCC handles tie-breaking, the point system. We're gonna to touch a little bit on that. And then we're gonna end before the question and answer to just give you a few pointers on, uh, on, on um, what you can do now to prepare for these filing windows. Because although these filing windows have been announced, they have not yet specifically been scheduled yet. So, um, so there's time for you to start uh, pulling your your resources together and, 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 and getting yourself in order for these uh, for these windows when they are ultimately announced. So I'd like to move on to uh, to talk about the uh, the windows themselves. All this kind of you know uh, took shape back in July when Chairman Pai, after testifying on the on Capitol Hill was questioned about um, whether or not the FCC was going to be opening up any new, um, specifically in that, in, in that case, they, he was asked about low power FM, but, but all educational service broadcasting windows. And he responded with a letter on the 21st of July, basically um, stating that they, there was a plan to, uh, to, to open up these windows, but that there were a few preparatory um, things that they had to get out of the way, including um, a pending, somewhat frozen commercial uh, window. The commercial FM window had been open. They were going to go to an auction, which is, that's how commercial stations resolve their uh, tiebreakers is through auctions. That's not going to be the case for the non-commercial stations. We'll get into how the tiebreakers are done there. But the idea was that they they needed to get that auction out of the way before, um, before they could move forward to opening uh, the windows. They also had to spell out some of the uh, uh, filing uh, uh, 
rules, and um, and then also we can sort of anticipate that there may be uh, some kind of a, a filing freeze, a modification filing freeze, in anticipation of the filing window. I tend to tell people this is a little bit like um, you know trying to repave a highway uh, when. When, when there's traffic zooming down, it, you have to sort of either steer the traffic around the area that you're working on or just stop the traffic altogether, otherwise you can't do it. So right now, again, the FCC is looking to sort of resolve some of their pending issues. They may end up with a freeze, but we're looking at probably 2021 uh, for, for these two windows to be opening up. And the full power FM, um, non-commercial FM uh, window will be first. It's going to be on the reserved frequency band uh, only. And it's going to be the first such window for that service for reserved uh, frequencies uh, since uh, 2007. So it's, it's been some time uh, since, we've, since we've seen one of these. The applications are going to be filed on what's called a Form 340 because uh, uh, these are non-commercial frequencies, there's no filing fee. Um, the low power FM window will happen after that. We think it may be also in 2021, but you know, be flexible because uh, depending on where the, 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 the non-commercial uh, uh, window opens, that's gonna push everything back. And remember, we've got this little thing called an election right in the middle that's going to probably lead to a brand new FCC chairman and shakeups at the FCC, which is not necessarily going to change the, the window, but it may change the timing of the window. So it's a good time to keep, keep uh, track of, uh, uh, of these announcements as they come out. But this is going to be the first one. Can you clarify what a, what a reserve frequency is? Yeah, sure. So this is what we're talking about are the the FM frequencies on the lower end of the uh, of the FM dial. Um, you'll see on our slide there. It's where you're largely talking about 88.1 megahertz through 91.9 megahertz, and this is a specific band of FM frequencies that have always traditionally been set aside only for non-commercial use. And that in in in, in, in the full power. Uh, a window that's going to be so it's not going to be you're not going to be uh, uh, able to apply for frequencies above that uh, above that band which by the way above that band you can also operate a non-commercial educational station but you don't have to that that band is open to, to commercial bands as well but below the 91.9 it's only non-commercial for low power fm it's going to be a separate form Form 318 is going to be used there. And again, as, uh, as in the case with the full power one, there's going to be no application fee. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Keenan, who's going to walk us through some of the aspects of the Form 340 for the full power non commercial station and what's required there. Keenan? Sure. All right. So as Frank said, uh, Form 340 is what uh, full power non commercial educational. Uh, applicants are going to be used uh, to file in this upcoming filing window. Um, as Frank said, the 318 is going to be used for LPFM, but the 340 will be used for NCE full power stations. So these next couple of slides will run through the information that is disclosed on the applications um, and uh, what, uh, just to give you an idea what type of information you're going to need to collect to prepare uh, uh, to file these uh, applications. So this form just gives you a real, uh, this slide I should say, just gives you a real uh, brief synopsis of all the information that is required on these forms. Um, before I start out, I just wanna let you know that the, uh, the forms are, uh, 340 is available on the FCC's website. However, it hasn't been updated yet uh, for the form that's actually gonna be used in the upcoming filing window. Uh, based on the order announcing uh, the new changes for NCE uh, new stations last year, there's going to be uh, some uh, uh, adjustments to this form that the FCC hasn't gotten around to make yet. Uh, of course, they kind of leave these things, you know, uh, uh, as they uh, to, uh, as they go along, so they just haven't been able to get to it. 
so we assume before uh, the, the window opens that some uh, things will be updated. And I'll, I'll note what will be updated uh, in the form based on what you'll, you'll see now on the website. So first thing uh, that is- Keenan, the form is, if they go to FCC.gov, the, the FCC's website, that's where they'll be able to see at least the old form to get an idea of, of, of what a 340 at least generally uh, looks like, right? Correct. Uh, if you go to FCC.gov, you can search for FCC forms and it'll bring you to a page with every single FCC form that's in existence. And on that page, you'll be able to find the form 340 and the current uh, instructions to kind of give you some more uh, background into uh, the, uh, the information that will be on these applications because uh, as I looked at the instructions the other day, there are about 20, 30 pages and they provide a lot of very valuable information necessary to prepare these forms. Um, so uh, uh, we encourage uh, uh, our listeners to uh, uh, take a look at those uh, uh, instructions and to familiarize yourself with what's coming up. And then when we, uh, and with the understanding that these instructions could be slightly altered uh, by the time the uh, application filing window comes around. Uh, so the first thing we need, uh, uh, applicants need to disclose on the form is uh, parties to the application. Uh, applicants are required to identify all individuals and organizations whose interests in the applicant are attributable. This means uh, uh, officers, board members, uh, parent entities uh, uh, of the applicant, um, and the like. Uh, there are specific uh, requirements in the FCC's rules for what is considered an attributable entity or individual or not. Uh, and this is something you could talk on a case-by-case -case basis with your FCC counsel to figure out what information you have to disclose and what information you don't have to disclose. Uh, the next important thing is uh, alien ownership. You must certify compliance with Section 310 of the Communications Act, which uh, pr uh, prohibits a, a, a foreign national or entity from ha being a licensee or permittee of a, a, a broadcast station. Uh, however, the FCC rules do allow for uh, uh, direct and indirect interest in the licensee or permittee to be allowed up to 25% and a waiver after that. So that's another area where you, if, if you're worried about the, 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 uh, this could be a hiccup for you, this is another area where you could talk more in detail with FCC counsel on whether or not this is a gr grounds that you need to uh, dive a little deeper into. Yeah, let me jump real quickly on that and just that on the alien ownership issue, it, this, it can yeah. be very, very complicated. Yes. And many of you are, are dealing with non-stock, non-profit corporations. So, it, you know, it can be the, the subtleties on compliance with the alien ownership rules. It, that, that could be its own webinar here. So we, we don't want to get too lost down that rabbit hole, but just know that it's, it, it is complicated. And, uh, and so that's one that you want to make sure that you double check that. Correct. Um, and another area equally as important is uh, for the legal certifications. Th these are all areas where you're going to want to run through with your FCC counsel about what things, uh, you know, if, if there's any problems. Uh, first being character issues, whether or not the applicant has the requisite character and fitness to be an, uh, an FCC licensee. And uh, that basically means you have to disclose whether or not this came up in the prior proceeding uh, or it's ongoing or the like, and the, your counsel can walk you through that. Program certification, this is a little bit more straightforward. Program certification means that you're gonna offer non-commercial programming um, that meets the needs of your community of license. And that basically is a certification that yes, you will provide non-commercial programming. Um, and uh, the, the next two requirements are uh, compliance with the FCC's local public notice rules, which have just changed as a effective tomorrow, I just found out this morning. So that's another area where uh, you, you basically are certifying here that after you file this application, you will notify the public uh, pursuant to um, the notification requirements for construction permit applications that you file the application. Uh, and uh, the, the rules are have just changed and uh, actually we're putting up a, a blog notice on our website about what the new rules are. And finally, you certify compliance with the EEO rules. The next area that is important to discuss is eligibility certifications. Uh, you must uh, uh, certify in the form that uh, you are an educational institution eligible to hold a uh, non-commercial educational uh, construction permit or license. Uh, 
uh, educational institutions can include both public and private schools, colleges, universities, uh, school districts, government entities, uh, the like. So the, the, there are some specific requirements. The, the, what the big kicker here is you're a, of a non-commercial nature, you're a nonprofit, um, and you're not a, you are not a for-profit business. Right, for so profit Keenan, for this, so if you're non-governmental, I mean, the important thing here is that you're, you're going to be a, a non-profit corporation and that you have to, you know, make sure that whatever has needed to be done to set up that non-profit corporation, certified and accepted, has, has been taken care of. Is that correct? Correct. You're a non-profit organization with an educational purpose. With an educational purpose, right? Yes. So, so, you don't have to be a university licensee. You can, you know, be a nonprofit like a community station with a mission that says you're absolutely. serving. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you're a university, if you're a, you know, if you're if you're if you're a college, that sort of thing. Um, um, Correct. You, you you can. Although I, I I would say if you if if you happen to be a for-profit college, I don't think you can do it. I don't think so. I I I'm, I don't believe you, a for-profit university can hold an SEC right. yeah license. Yeah. Okay. Quick so question, next, actually, yes. gentlemen, um, is this going to be filed through the CDBS system, or are we aware of what where that's those filings are going to happen? Most likely the LMS system. The FCC okay. is retiring the, C, the CDBS system slowly but surely, and generally speaking, they're not adding new forms to the uh, CDBS database. Granted, the Form 340 already exists, but the fact that a 340 uh, is going through some changes would uh, l likely means that it's gonna be filed in the new LMS system. It's a good question, Darna. So because those who have went through this win these windows in the past are probably familiar with CDBS, just know that the SEC has rolled out an entirely new operating system called LMS to handle these sorts of things. So just be aware of that. Well, we've still got a little bit of um, back and forth on this 501c3 and educational mission. Um, what's an example of a nonprofit with, with educational mission that is not a school district or a university college? Tina asked that question. And there are literally hundreds of examples of mm -hmm. that in community radio. So for example, KBUT, Crested Butte, that is a non-commercial educational licensee with a mission to be um, of service through education um, to the, the citizenry. So that's how that, that example. Right, like here in Washington, we've got like two non-commercial stations. These are, you know, big stations. One is a university, American University, WAMU, but WETA is basically uh, operated by a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a non-profit educational organization, the Pacifica Foundation. I mean, that's a, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a one that immediately comes to mind that is not university affiliated. Keenan, what about a church radio? Uh, Frank, I'll throw that yeah. to you. No, so absolutely. Yeah. Church can, <laughs> religious broadcasting can be uh, 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 a very uh, uh, multifaceted issue. So, Frank, but, but, but yeah. the, the the answer is 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 that religious organizations, religious educational organizations, are absolutely eligible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have to show that you have an ed educational. Uh, a function as part of your organization. You may also have a, a, a church. You may have a, a, a you know a, 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 a congregation that's part of all that. But um, but I would suggest my is that if you are a church, um, it probably would be a good idea to perhaps set up a separate educational organization affiliated can be affiliated with the church to uh, to to actually apply for the application so that you don't. You know, you know, keep those boards separate. Keep keep it, keep keep the organization separate. I think it just it's just, it's cleaner and it's neater for the people who are prepping you for the application process. But absolutely, religious organizations are 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 able to participate if they satisfy the educational purpose. So two more quick clarifications, and then I know we need to move on. Um, how about Native American tribes, and can a city apply? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna actually the, okay. the answer to those are yes on both, and in fact, even in the case of, tr of, of, of tribal organizations, that may actually get you a, um, some 
points in the tiebreaker system because the FCC has that built in. But um, we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, 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 that's gonna be in an upcoming slide very soon. So I'm gonna throw it back to Keenan. Sure. Uh, just to run quickly down the last couple of uh, big points uh, on information you have to disclose in the form. Financial, you have to demonstrate you have net assets to construct and operate the station for three months without having additional funding. Uh, you have to disclose channel and facility information, your community license, the channel that you uh, propose to operate on, your station class. Uh, you have to disclose antenna data, the tower coordinates, height, antenna height, and type. Uh, technicals, technical certifications, uh, compliance with uh, environmental effects, which means the FCC's uh, radio frequency uh, exposure requirements. Broadcast facility, this is the FCC's uh, technical requirements for stations and uh, contour protection requirements. Um, that is also uh, information that you, you should consult your engineer for uh, in preparing uh, th this form in conjunction with your FCC counsel. Okay, so going on, these are the last two, uh, most, probably most important parts of the 340 that we'll get into uh, today. Uh, the first is the reasonable cert assurance certification. Uh, this is a brand new uh, certification in the 340 that has yet to be added, uh, and presumably it will be added before the, the opening of the window per the FCC's order, saying that it would be. Uh, here, the applicant must certify that it has reasonable assurance from the tower owner its agent or representative that the, uh, this, the proposed station's tower site is going to be available. Um, this reasonable assurance requirement is actually, from the FCC's perspective, nothing new. It's always been a requirement in the rules, but this is the first time the FCC is specifically putting it into the form to, for applicants to certify compliance with. Uh, in addition to saying yes or no that you, you are complying with the reasonable assurance requirement, uh, you must also show that uh, 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 contact information, basically provide bona fides that you do have reusable insurance. You, ha uh, you have to identify a contact person and a telephone number of uh, the uh, t tower owner or the, or the person granting you access to the site. And uh, we haven't seen yet uh, what specifically how this information is gonna be uh, uh, required in the form yet, but we'll know before the filing window. And it's, the, and it's the need to identify that contact person that's new from last time. And that also shows up, we'll see in the slides coming up on the LPFM application as well. And that's because the SEC is trying to close up a loophole that they found from last time of people certifying that they had assurance for a tower site when in fact they really didn't. So the SEC is trying to put a little teeth in that requirement and actually make you, you know, fork up the name and the number of the person you talk to in case they want to double check. Right, yeah, so uh, basically they're trying to prevent, uh, you know, applicants later on down the line saying we don't have a site and they uh, granted a CP to someone who's never gonna build it. And, you know, it, it's just very inefficient from the FCC's purpose. Fair di distribution of service. Uh, this is gonna be the start of how the FCC breaks, uh, you know, evaluates uh, what they call mutu mutually exclusive applicants. Basically applicants that are presenting the same uh, 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 sort of application for the same area, for the, the same frequency, um, and basically how the, the FCC is using criteria to go through and figure out which applicant they're gonna award the, uh, uh, the, the new station permit to. So the fair distribution of service is initial, uh, initial MX tiebreaker uh, before going into the point system. So, and as I will explain on the next so slide, I'll, so, I'll show you uh, how everything breaks down. But for fair distribution of service, um, you'll, uh, the, the, the tiebreakers are first overall reception of service to a given population of area, uh, tribal priority, uh, you, you'll show if you uh, meet that criteria, if you meet the four factors for service to pri uh, tribal lands, and uh, whether or not the proposed station is gonna provide the first or second uh, non-commercial radio service to a given uh, area or population. Um, these three factors the FCC weighs um, as a first to decide what between two mutually exclusive applications. And if they find a winner in that process, they don't go into the point system or the later tiebreakers um, and they'll award the application based on that. They don't have to go any further. Um, so to kind of clear this up, th this is how the FCC uh, goes through the selection process. You're either basically once an application is filed 
and they close the filing window, uh, the applicant is either classified as what they call a singleton, which means they're not mutually exclusive with any other application out there, and they will be awarded a CP uh, if they meet the, all the other uh, FCC's criteria in the 340. If they are mutually exclusive, uh, uh, they uh, uh, at all, and this means that uh, because, uh, you know, you know free, um, uh, uh, if they're mutually exclusive, uh, this means that there's conflicting NCE applications um, that are uh, uh, conflicting because of technical requirements. Like I said earlier, same frequency, same community license, can't award duplicate stations in the same areas, the same person. Uh, so basically what they are doing is here is they're gonna start going through criteria to resolve the, what they call the mutual exclusivity. First was the fair distribution, which we discussed. The second is the uh, point system where they, they could be awarded up to a maximum of seven points. And if they still have uh, some kind of uh, conflict between uh, one or uh, two or more applicants, then they go into further tiebreakers to, to figure out who to award the station to. So for the, the first, uh, after uh, uh, fair distribution, uh, the first uh, process they go through is the point system selection. As I said, a maximum, excuse me, my mouth was getting dry there. At, at first they go through the point system selection process. A maximum of seven merit points will be awarded from four criteria. First is uh, demonstrating your established local applicant. Applicants that certify as a local and established for at least two years immediately prior to filing their application can gain points here. Um, why, uh, uh, as a departure from the 07 filing window, uh, applicants don't need, uh, need to demonstrate that they updated their corporate documents showing uh, localism and diversity, but they can demonstrate uh, uh, otherwise in the application uh, uh, that they uh, have been local and established for at least two years uh, prior to filing this application to meet the, the award of that, the, the, those three points. The second criteria uh, uh, under the point system selection is the diversity of ownership. Here you can be awarded up to two points and it's awarded if the principal community contour of the applicant's proposed station does not overlap those of any other station in which a party to the application holds a tribal interest. Basically what they're trying to look for here is you, uh, you as the licensee is the first time you are providing service in a given area. But if you have another station in that market, um, you can't get the, can't be considered you have diversity of ownership because you're already, you, you already have a footprint on that area. Alternatively, uh, an applicant can get credit for being a statewide network. Um, a, a statewide, uh, this is awarded for certain statewide networks providing programming to accredited schools. Um, as I said, you can either get credit for being a statewide network or having diversity uh, of ownership, but not both. So it's the one or the other. And then the final uh, uh, criteria for point system selection is technical parameters. Basically, you can get up to two points here if you advance the best technical proposal, I, uh, which means that you're going to advance service to the largest population in an area, um, excluding areas over water, basically actual areas where people are going to be listening uh, to your station. Um, you get one point if the proposed service area and population are 10% or greater than the next best area and population proposals, and, but you, or you could get two points if there's a 25% difference. And th these uh, differences are uh, determined by looking at the proposed uh, 60 dBU contour. So the next thing, if there is still a conflict between uh, mutually exclusive applicants, the FCC goes into what they call further tiebreakers. Uh, and these are four categories, two, the latter two are new, um, that the FCC uses to resolve whether or not uh, uses to resolve the mutual exclusivity and determine who to award the license to, or permit, I should say, to. First, the FCC looks at existing authorizations. Um, applicant with a few attributable authorizations at the time of filing would, would be chosen. If there's still a conflict after that, um, they look at pending applications. Here, the FCC will select the applicant with the fewest pending applications in the same service. There's still a tie after that. The FCC is now going to look at continuous legal existence, which means that uh, if the applicant was in continuous legal existence as a legal entity from the previous NCC filing window to the present, so from 2007 to the present, 
uh, you would get credit there if the other mutually exclusive stations, you know, were only formed in, uh, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, uh, you would win that tiebreaker. Uh, and finally, dismiss applications. If after going through all three of the above tiebreakers, the FCC uh, will look at uh, whether an applicant lost points in a previous window, but continued uh, 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 basically they, they missed out after going through things and uh, um, uh, they uh, uh, are now up for their next chance. Basically it's giving people a second chance here. Um, in order to uh, qualify for this, you need to show that you didn't acquire any other station in the last, in, since 2007. Um, and uh, it, it, if that happens, th this tiebreaker could be applied. Basically what it's, it, like I said, to, uh, to, uh, to clarify is, uh, if in the last window, your application was dismissed because going through the tiebreakers, you, uh, uh, you, you lost, um, then you didn't get another station since then, uh, acquire a station somehow, uh, uh, th th you will get a credit here towards your tiebreaker. Um, space and once you go yeah. Just to jump in here, Keenan, I apologize. Yes. As Keenan pointed out, these last two are new, yes. uh, different from last time that the FCC has, has put into place. And, and there's something else here, which is that um, the FCC has now proposed, like last time, to limit the number of applications you can file in this window to 10, to 10 applications in this window. So, um, um, and so I just want to note that that is yet to be approved, but it's in, but it's in the workings. Um, Keenan, I'll let you wrap this up, and then I'll take over on LBFMs. Sure. And before before um, Keen, after Keenan wraps up, and before we get into LPFM, let's clear up some questions specific to this really quickly. Okay, okay. go Keenan. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, basically, you know, once they go through all the tiebreakers, uh, the applicant with a higher score after applying the tiebreakers is designated, uh, is going to be awarded the CP, uh, the, the, the rest of the applications are dismissed. All right, so that's what I got here. Um, so before we go to the next slide, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, so we've got a few to clear up here. Is the financial requirement... Um, Oh, typo here, Donald. Um, something of certification or Donald, maybe you could uh, type that again. I'm not exactly sure what um, what that fourth word is. Uh, here's another one. Uh, let me, let me actually, let, before he, while he's retiring, just just real, on the financial requirement, we don't know yet exactly what it's going to be. But you know, as last time, there is going to be a requirement that you can show that you have the ability to build the station um, if you are permitted and the ability to operate the station for a certain amount of time, um, you know, if you are awarded the permit. So this is one where it's going to be a little dynamic as it comes out, but, but, uh, but, there, is, but there is going to be an aspect to that that you want to be able to show. Sally, I'm sorry, go back to you. No, that's right. So at what point in the three-year post-CP award period must the applicant show three months of operating expenses that are on hand? I think they, they need to be able to show that yes. um, before, you know, prior to-, to In the to application, they need to show Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think there's- uh, uh, I mean, if you've been operating it for three years, then you, you know, you, you know you, you, you've satisfied by deed, but, uh, but this is really before um, at, the, at the outset, Basically, what they're trying to do is well, you'll you'll notice all of you that a lot of these rules are are designed to try to you know discourage people who are speculators who might want to you know the, the FCC in its long history has had you know bad experiences with people applying for licenses then immediately who don't intend to build them and immediately flip them you know that sort of thing that's why things like the limits of applications, the holding periods, the financial qualifications, all these sorts of things are really all designed to make sure that the applicant is, is really bona fide and intends to build and operate this facility. So what is the first overall reception service? Is it the largest population served? 
it's it, it's really going to be the, the 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 first station license to that community. Correct. Right. The first okay. radio service license to that community. Right. Yeah. And then combining a question here, is there a specific number of licenses that will be given out or an anticipated number? And, and approximately how long is the process from application to decision? That's a good question. Um, there, are, there are a limited number of, of licenses that are gonna be given out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't know what those are gonna be yet uh, because again, it's gonna really gonna be a function of, of, of what, the, what, what the window announcement uh, uh, looks like, but you know, for, for obvious reasons, there are always going to be finite numbers, and it's going to be, as you can well imagine, much harder to plot down new frequencies in some place like New York or Miami versus maybe some more rural areas where the frequency, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the spectrum is is not quite as congested. As far as what the entire process is, how long that's going to take. You know, that's a little there's a little bit of crystal ball gazing here, but I, I mean, I mean, I, I think it's not unreasonable to think that from the closing of the filing window mm -hmm. uh, through you know determining they, they're going to be a, they're going to announce who which stations you know who are who are the the MX groups they're going to give them you know uh, there's going to be uh, some opportunity for for settlements and amendments. And then and the like, and then they're going to uh, do the, the point system. You know, from the closing of the window, you know, maybe you're looking at six months. I'm going to say, uh, but you know, you know, I, I could be proven wrong. Things like you know, this this commercial window, it, <laughs> they were supposed to be done with that thing like back in March, and then all of a sudden COVID came along and just froze everything. So, you right, know, um, just keep that in mind. So. If a station wins an MX pool as a result of a first or second NCE service, will they be required to serve all the population exactly as originally proposed, or could they modify the CP to cover more people from a different tower at the expense of a few of the original population? That's a really good question. I think you know, I, 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 I you know, I think there is going to be an expectation that you are going to largely maintain your 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 original service area. However, you know, I, I, I think that is one where the depending on what you are thinking to do, you may want to talk to your engineer and your council about that just to see what, because again, you know, uh, you, 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 you may just run into a situation where if you are lucky, if you are fortunate enough to get the permit, the commission is just going to tell you, no, you can't do it. So it's really going to be a function of, of how but you're looking to change the, the parameters that were in your, your, your application to begin with. Okay, one more to clear up, and then we've got LPFM stuff that I'm gonna sort of bundle as you head into your LPFM section, Frank. Um, sure. But this, this, one's, this has been in the kitty for a while here. It's from Michael, who says, we recently had a UHF DTV station move to VHF channel six in our area during the repack. Okay. Does that make any sense to yep. anybody? Yep. No, 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 exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, I, I know they're talking about removing uh, channel six protection in July, 2021. Will there be a requirement to protect this TV six station when filing for a signal in the NCE window if it happens before the rule sunset next July? Well, that, that's, that's a very, uh, the, 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 the answer to that question is going to be, it depends. I know exactly what he's talking about. This is, you know, a, 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 this is a, 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 a process that happened in the, with the television uh, stations be, you know, being repacked as a result of, of, of the reverse auction. Um, channel six is, uh, is that, is that weird frequency that has sort of a, can potentially have a dual use because you have a lot of what are called Franken FMs that are on 87.7 um, megahertz um, that are not technically considered reserve band FMs because they're actually all they're doing is broadcasting audio on a television channel. Um, you know, they, uh, there's been some need to protect those. <clears throat> I think that you, know, you, you are gonna need to 
protect not only existing but proposed um, frequencies in your application and keep that in mind. So this is also one, a good one to keep that in mind when you're, when you're consulting with your, with your engineer and, and putting your application together. Okay, so as we head into LPFM land with you, Frank, um, there's, I'm going to bundle these three. Okay. Um, one from the channel. Why don't you switch over the, um, switch over the slide. Next slide. Okay. So uh, from Joe, we have an LPFM. Any way to get diversity ownership points if we want to replace with full power? Um, well, I, I didn't quite follow you there. We are going to talk a little bit about diversity points, but ask okay. the question again. Is there any way to get diversity ownership points? In LPFM. Yeah, if we want to replace with a full power. I don't know what full power would have to do with we that. If we want to replace with yeah. it. Maybe Joe, oh, you So in other words, he has a full power station that he's looking for. Am I, is he saying he has a full power station that he's looking for? So he has an LPFM. Yes. Oh, oh, he has an LPFM, which he's going to divest. Right. And, and then, um, and then, oh, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, if you're gonna apply for the full power FM, you, you have to divest from that right. low power FM, um, you know, it, it's not just a diversity credit issue, it's a qualification issue. Okay. Um, so you're gonna have to divest from that LPFM, whether you like it or not. Okay, and, and does acquiring another station include an LPFM? Um, well, again, I, 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 I wanna sort of reiterate, it, it, you, you cannot get an LPFM because the LPFM the LPFM rules have strict re ownership requirements where you are not allowed. Um, I mean, you are there. There are some narrow exceptions that allow for, for for two LPFMs, but by and large, if you have it, if your organization have it has an LPFM, neither the organization nor anybody on the board of the organization can have an interest in a, in a full power or another LPFM. So basically, they would need to divest of an LPFM only after awarded a full power CP? They would, they would have to, there, there's a process in the application procedure where you can pledge to divest and you're going to, and, and that is a relatively new, we, we didn't do a deep dive into that one because it's complicated, but there is a process, a new process where you can pledge to divest from from um, from from a, a situation like this, an LPFM um, a, a, as part of your application, and you would be obviously held to that before you were awarded the permit. Okay. And finally, what if you're a public access TV station looking to get into the audio space for the first time? What would be the first step? If you're a public access TV station, which I take to mean that you are you do, you do not hold a, that you do not hold a, 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 a television channel that you are, does that mean, does it mean you have like a, a, a public access channel on the local cable system? I, I would think it's well, probably anyhow, contracted with, yeah, yeah, with the city for, they don't own the channel necessarily, but they may be contracted with the city. I, mean, I think in that, the that, 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 that may be a disqualifying factor here, having the, 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 the public access a uh, 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 channel. Um, so, cause we're, we're, if you if you look at on the very first slide here, the, on the what, the, the fifth, sixth slot slide there, says LPFM licenses cannot be issued to an individual commercial entities. Also existing broadcasters, cable television system operators, that's system operators, not necessarily channels, newspaper publishers and other media entities are ineligible. So, um, so uh, they, they, I, I think that having a channel may be okay, and then they would just go through the, I, I don't know that it necessarily would be a diversifier, a dis diversity disqualifier, and they would go through the usual hoops. Okay, so I would say let's, let's get to your slides and see if that doesn't okay. I'm gonna go through these, uh, I'll be, a, so um, LPFM, again, we've touched on a lot of these already uh, as far as who can apply, uh, non-governmental or uh, non-profit educational organizations, non-profits uh, with an educational purpose, uh, government or non-profit entities providing local uh, public safety training. You know, this might be like the, the local department of transportation, that sort of thing. Um, 
Somebody asked earlier about tribal license, uh, nations. Tribal nations that provide non-commercial radio services are, are eligible, and we've already talked about some of the disqualifiers. Um, the, the FCC specifically makes um, the uh, LPFM system a little bit you more user friendly than for the full power. They actually have a frequency finder. This happened last time as well. We put on up the, uh, the, the website there uh, where the frequency finder uh, is located. There's a software program there for you to locate an available frequency in your area. We've touched on that you use a form 318. Those are also available, but again, bear in mind, as was the case with the full power uh, applications that those may be updated as we get closer to the window. Um, these are certification based applications. So um, they require the, the applicant to document some of the claims and, and support some of your claims and the ultimately your qualification to get any of the uh, qualifying points in the point system are credited only when you provide the timely provide the documentation to support your certifications. Um, LPFM applications are considered MX. We've already talked about what MX is to be mutually exclusive when the distance between the facilities and the and two applications do not meet the minimum distance requirements. If you're looking for the minimum distance requirement requirements for both full power and low power FM, um, those can be found at section 73 0.807 of the commission's rules. Uh, it's, a, it's 24 kilometers uh, for LPFM, if I, if I recall. Um, next slide. As with full power, we have a point system um, with, uh, uh, with LPFM. So the point system here is a little uh, different. It's a little more simplified than the more complicated three-part system that you had with full powers. But again, um, you know, competing LPFM applications are, that are mutually exclusive are resolved through a point system. There's a maximum of six merit points based on six criteria. There's one point for each uh, one of the six criteria. And those are uh, that you are, number one, that you're an established community presence of at least two years within the community. Again, you're gonna see with LPFM, there's a real push to make sure that you have a connection with that community. Because again, they are looking to uh, discourage speculators who might you know, uh, come in from outside or just looking to you know, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, market in, 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 in spectrum. So that you have a connection of at least two years, that gets you a point, that you have a commitment to originate local programming of at least eight hours of locally program locally originated programming a commitment to maintain a main studio in in the community if you actually satisfy both numbers two and three you get a, another point and there's number four that four is where you have a commitment to originate local programming and you have a main studio um, number five is div diversity and ownership credit this is very similar to what was the criteria that was already talked about under non-commercial stations, as far as what you know, uh, you know, interest uh, in, 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 in stations and, and the like, um, and then again, tribal applicants uh, serving tribal lands within the service area of the proposed station also gets you a a um, a, a, a point in the uh, in the merit system, um, just like with non-commercial stations. Applicants with the highest score in an MX are deemed to be tentative selectees. But, and here's one that, that where LPFM it, it differs a little bit. Applicants that are tied for the highest point total are subject to both a voluntary and an involuntary time sharing process. So what does that mean? Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Tied applicants have the opportunity to propose a voluntary time sharing arrangement. And this is where the proposals include, uh, where proposals include all time, uh, all tied applications, applications that are tied in the point system. Each applicant is treated as a tentative selectee. You know, the, the, the highest, if you have like the, the top highest, if let's say you had four or five applicants, the top two, 
uh, could be treated as a, a type of uh, 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 selectee. Obviously, they cannot both be awarded. Um, alternatively, any two or more of those tied MX applicants can propose to share the frequency by filing a voluntary time sharing agreement and aggregating their points. We saw this a little bit, uh, the, 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 the question that we got a little bit earlier was talking about the television repack and the television reverse auction. And anybody who is familiar with that process that happened is familiar with the fact that in, in, in the television re, uh, reverse auction repack, you had channel sharing, where basically a, a station could you know, sell its a channel in the auction and then enter into a channel sharing arrangement with another uh, with another station in the market where they two two parties literally share the same applicant uh, the same uh, frequency and, and and are both on the on the same license this is a very similar sort of situation so the idea here is that you know the the, the top uh, 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 point getters can aggregate get their points by offering up a a voluntary timeshare um, only the applicants that are tied for the highest points can enter into a time sharing and aggregate points. You know, they're trying to prohibit the, 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 the bottom, uh, those on the bottom end of the, of the point system to suddenly move their way up to the top to a, to a, a, a channel sharing. If there's no voluntary time sharing agreement, then the FCC assigns, can assign involuntary time sharing arrangements. And that is done to no more than three of the tied applicants in each group, each MX group. So applicants can now acknowledge and disclose an intended point system aggregation. So you can sort of just, you know, agree at the beginning that you are going to aggregate your, your points through a, through a, through a, uh, through a time sharing arrangement. Um, the FCC has now streamlined it, its, uh, its process for, for the, for the time sharing rules. And they've put in place a 90 day deadline, a period for adopting voluntary time shares. Um, this is what will happen, you know, right after the applications are in and they announce who is, who is uh, uh, mutually exclusive. Um, um, the, um, the, uh, the mandated time shares, these are the involuntary ones, if a voluntary time share is not arranged, are now capped at three applicants. There are no more than three can be engaged in a time share. And the interesting thing, and again, this is like in television, a time share is actually, it, this is not like a time brokerage arrangement or, uh, or where you know, one party is the licensee and the other party you know, brokers time on the station. This is a situation where both parties are on the license. They actually have to coordinate in television. You know, if there's if there's a modification of the license down the road, you know, both parties have to modify. You basically you have you know each party has their own license, and you may have certain day parts where each party is allowed to put on programming on that station. So it, it, it's 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 kind of like having uh, you know a roommate where you guys have to take turns on who's going to use the bathroom and when. I mean, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a long-term uh, uh, coupling uh, uh, and, and, and cooperation that's required in, in this arrangement. Uh, so we got, um, I want to make sure we get through all the slides. So just giving everyone a heads up that we're going to hang in there and, and keep moving through, okay. even though we're coming to the top of the hour. Okay, okay so, um, so we're, we, we are really at the end. Um, really just a couple of quick points on how to prepare. Um, you know, number one, I, I uh, suggest that you start talking to some engineers. You know, and now's a good time. I know the LPFM window is designed to be very user friendly, but I think you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna be in the broadcasting uh, world, you're gonna need to establish a good relationship with an engineer and careful engineering analysis is, is important and it's important to start planning now before the window is open. Um, track the filing windows. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 you know the, they haven't been uh, put on, uh, on the schedule yet. So, uh, and, and you're not gonna get a personal phone call like the uh, Nobel Prize Committee saying the window's open. You need to keep track of these things. This is also where having you know, professionals uh, like an engineer, like an FCC lawyer, is, 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 is important because, you know, our, there, there will be announcements about this on our blog, 
you know, your, your engineers will be uh, attracting these sorts of things. And some of these may get pushed back beyond 2021 to 2022. So make, keep track of these windows. Retain an FCC uh, council because they can help you on preparing, on structuring your organization, walking you through the points, the qualifications, alien ownership, all those issues that we talked about earlier. And then lastly, and I think I just, I threw this one in because I thought is to please, please beware of scam lines. Um, in, the, in the last LPFM window, and I don't want to hit this one too hard, but I think it warrants uh, mentioning. There were a lot of real kind of sketchy types out there selling equipment that was not authorized, selling engineering services when they really weren't engineers. I'm not talking about legit engineers, but I'm talking about, or, or you know, they, they were doing these, you know, back of the napkin engineering uh, where they basically had, you know, LPFM applicants, um, you know, applying in places where there was absolutely no way they could be granted while at the same process selling them equipment, you know, and then these poor people were stuck with expensive equipment, you know, basically know who you're dealing with, be, you know, double check people who are trying to sell you package deals, we're gonna sell you, you know, our equipment, our engineering services, all this sort of stuff. And please do not purchase equipment before you have a construction permit. Because if you don't get that permit, you know, you're never gonna be able to use that equipment, you're not gonna be able to unload it, and you're gonna be stuck. And then those folks are not gonna answer the phone call when you wanna to try to return it. So just something to keep in mind. And uh, last slide has our contact information. Um, there, so you know, please feel free to take down, uh, and, and also you'll see our website, our blog, um, and we're on Twitter. So uh, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And if there's any time left, uh, we'll take any remaining questions that there may be. Ernesto, do you do you have any that you're sitting on? Um, I see we do have a few that look like they may have been answered, but there are some in the chat that I think are pretty interesting, uh, including um, one about asking if there's a channel finder uh, for full power NCE similar to LPFM. The LPFM one is very handy. Of course. It's a good question. My, no, my understanding is not. I think that's one where you're really going to have to talk to an engineer and see what, 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 what the FCC announcement is going to look like. I, I don't believe that the LPFM channel finder can be, it's, it's an algorithm that's specifically designed for LPFM uh, uh, and, and it's, you know, and the side, remember LPFM, we're talking about a much smaller, you know, uh, 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 coverage area as what those, so, so a, 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 an area that might be able to fit in an LPFM might not be able to fill in a fit in a full power station. A couple of other questions before we wrap up. Um, this, and I believe you answered this, LP, this LPFM window is for the non-COM band. The, the, I think the, the, in, in the LPFM window, there may be greater flexibility on that as far as being able to, to, um, to it's, it's not necessarily gonna be in that reserved band um, for, for, and so in your channel finder, you may be able to locate uh, of channel frequencies that are outside of the non-com band, but because they are in they are they are low power FM stations, which are its own service, they are all by by law have to be uh, operated as non-commercial educational stations. They cannot be operated as commercial stations. And finally, I just wanted to ask a question about any ballpark on what. Uh, a, a, an organization interested in getting to LPFM should be budgeting for legal and engineering services. That's a that's a that, that that's a real good question. Um, and and, and for, you're talking about low p, low power FM. Um, you know, I I I am not as well as uh, averse to speak on 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 the engineering side. I mean, I think that because so the LPFM is designed so that you can do so much of it on your own. Um, you know, I think the, the, the preparation and, and, and the filing of the applications in, in the LF, LPFM service from, from, from legal uh, perspective, you know, you're, you're probably talking, you know, depending on who you talk to, that they, those can either run from, you know, say, on the low end, say $500 to $1,000 up to maybe $2,500, somewhere in that, in that range for the applications. Um, the engineering again. I'm not 
I don't want to speak to engineers because I don't know. But again, it's going to vary because again, you know, as with everything else, you know, with engineers, with law firms, with accountants, whatever, you know, you, there, are, there are smaller, you know, solo practitioners that may be, you know, on the lower end of the, uh, 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 of the, uh, 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 of the price range, but, you know, have their solo practitioners, so they may be limited in, in how much they can handle, that sort of thing, up to, you know, firms. Well, you, you, our firm is sort of like in, in, in the middle, or we're, 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 we're about 25 lawyers, and they, but you have firms that, that are out there that have, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of lawyers. So, you know, do a little bit of comparative shopping is what I would suggest. Definitely do that. Call, get a few different names, make a few f different phone calls, and, 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 it, and it's worth the time to do a little comparative shopping. I and mean, that goes for the engineer as well. Keenan and Frank, I want to say thank you so much for this start of what I expect is going to be an ongoing conversation, given we are not expecting the full power window to open up until 2021 and potentially LPFM in 2021, but could be pushed back. Who knows at this point? I think uh, pandemic has changed everything for all of us. So thank you so much for answering questions. I expect sure. we will be convening everyone at some point again to have more of these dialogues. If you joined us a little bit late, please Please remember that you can subscribe to NFCB's newsletter at nfcb.org. Frank and Keenan have comlog blog links posted right on the page in front of you. Please feel free to follow that. We'll be keeping you all updated on these issues going forward. Sally, I want to give you the last word. Ooh. Uh. Sally just had a birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday to <laughs> Sally. <laughs> I'm, I would say, you know, it, it's a complicated, lots of details, make friends with a friendly engineer and an attorney. And, um, you know, like everybody just stay calm and carry on. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. Thank you so much for that, Sally. And please remember that this will be posted at NFCB's website. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to us, nfcb.org forward slash contact if you need anything. And thank you so much for making time to attend today. Have a great day.